come to talk about the Lord's seven letters to the Ecclesias in Asia. And I think uh, I've noticed something in the last few years that when Ecclesias choose subjects, they tend now to choose, well, at least many of them do, to choose subjects which have to do with the last days. Uh, for example, I've done a couple of, of studies on Jude, contending earnestly for the faith on this tour. Uh, and this is the second time that I've done the seven letters of the Apocalypse. And I think it tells us something. I think most of us are aware of the pressures under which we as individuals and as ecclesias and as a brotherhood have come uh, in recent days. And those pressures are eroding the vitals out of the truth, are they not? And I think if we were honest with ourselves, we would say that's probably happening to us and our ecclesia in some form. And so it's probably a good thing that we have an opportunity to look at the Lord's counsel and encouragement, exhortation, and sometimes sharp rebuke of the ecclesias to whom he wrote in these seven letters that are contained in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And the statement that keeps coming out of those letters is, I know thy works. And if Christ knew the works of those seven representative ecclesias, of the latter portion of the first century, then he certainly knows our works. He knows the character of the ecclesias to which we belong. He knows the quality of the members of those ecclesias. He knows what they're up to. He knows what their leadership is about. And he has, not an opinion, because the Lord doesn't have opinions. He is the judge of all the earth. He will have a statement to make if he hasn't already made it, about the ecclesias that you belong to, or the ecclesia that you belong to. He knows our works. And in the same way that he wrote to these ecclesias, one day we will find out what he thought about us. So we're going to find there are some challenges in this study. And it all comes, of course, from John secreted, a very aged man on the Isle of Patmos. Now, I had a very wonderful experience flying from Tel Aviv to Athens in 1992. Very good, clear summer day. The plane was crossing the Aegean Sea. I had studied the map because I was going to look out of the window. I made sure I got a right-hand window. And I looked down, and there it was, this little jewel in the Aegean Sea called Patmos. I got a tingle up my spine like you don't get all that often in life, but when it happens, you know, it's something very special to you. This was the place to which Christ, sitting at the right hand of God, sent his angel to John to deliver the apocalypse, the final message that he would give to his servants. And it starts with that wonderful vision of the multitudinous Christ from which he draws most of the introductions to the seven letters that he writes to the seven ecclesias of Asia. Now come to Revelation chapter 1 and see how John describes himself here. In verse 9, he says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And he says, I was in... <laughs> Not the spirit, but in spirit. In other words, John was, as it were, in immortality. Because he then looks back. He has a voice behind him. He looks back. And it's going to tell us the history that leads to the kingdom of God. Of course, the next thing that we find is the vision of the multitudinous Christ. It represents you and me with our brother John in glory at the sight of our Lord Jesus Christ as he sets about the task of establishing the kingdom. It's how Revelation starts. Well, we've been made, it says, in verses 6 and 7, kings and priests. So here, brothers and sisters, of course, it's the greatness of our hope. But for the time being, it's pressure, isn't it? John says, I am your brother and companion in tribulation. Now, this word tribulation, as you can probably see, is the Greek word phlipsis. It has some rather remarkable occurrences. One of those is Acts chapter 14, verse 22. Through much tribulation, says the apostle, we must enter the kingdom of God. March pressure. You know what? There is no generation in history that's endured more pressure than ours. 
But we're not persecuted, brothers and sisters, are we? For our faith, we'd be better off if we were. We're not persecuted. We're not troubled by our neighbours. But we are the most pressured generation ever. And that pressure comes from materialism and peace, from all things that this world offers, from its technologies, and I won't go into that now, but I think I don't need to go into that. Because you know and I know that I and my children and my grandchildren are under extreme pressure from this world. And if we survive it, it will only be by faith that we have perceived that there are greater things to come. And we have locked into that, set our vision on that, set our course towards the kingdom and overcome in the strength that God can provide. You know, in Revelation chapter 7, for the sake of time, I'm not going to spend much time on that, but in Revelation chapter 7, in that marvellous chapter which, chapter which sets forth the vision of the 144,000, the, the, the glorified family of Israel, of which we are part, brothers and sisters, in that vision we read, just quickly look at it, verses 13 and 14 of chapter 7. It says this, And one of the elders answered and said unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest? And he said, These are they which came out of great tribulation. Great tribulation? Incredible pressure. Same word, flips us. And then it says this, And it washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I used to wonder why that phrase was on the end there. Well, brothers and sisters, I now know. I know why that phrase is on the end. Because the pressure of this world has got to me from time to time and I don't think I'm a stranger in that. It's got to me from time to time. My flesh hasn't been able to resist it. What about yours? And I've needed to go to my father and to ask for forgiveness because I've been touched by this grubby, filthy, corrupt world. How about you? I've needed to wash my robes in the blood of the Lamb. What about you? And you see, our Lord Jesus Christ knew. He knew that this final generation of Christadelphians would go through the most difficult time of any Christadelphians of any age. That's why we've got the apocalypse. That's why we've got these letters. That's why it makes that statement that these have come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Last time I washed something in blood, it came out red. You know what I mean? It's the most effective washing you can ever have. The forgiveness of sin. Brothers and sisters, here is our companion, John, in tribulation. He knew a bit about that. They reckon they put him boiling oil at some point of his life. Brother Thomas says this in Eureka, volume 1, page 116, about the value of the apocalypse. They are not to be negligent readers, negligent readers, or hearers, I should say, if they would be blessed. They must keep or observe narrowly the things which have been written in it. They must scrutinise them and by their, by their aid watch. Behold, he says, I come as a thief, said Jesus, blessed is he that watcheth. But they only can watch to any purpose who narrowly observe. And he's making reference here to Revelation chapter 1 and verses 1 to 3. In particular, verse 3. But we read, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And there, of course, is the evidence that this is given for us. The time is at hand. Brother Thomas goes on to say this. The apocalypse was given to this end that the servants of the deity who are keeping their garments might be able to discern the signs of the times preceding the apocalypse of Christ. And the real nature of things extend in their several generations. No believer understanding this prophecy could be seduced into fellowship with the clerical institutions of the world because he would see them in all their native deformity and sin. That's why we must remain a separate community. In an age of ecumenical peacemaking, we must remain as a separate community. And that's what this book is all about. And there are seven blessings in this book as there are seven of many things. <coughs> it is the book of the Spirit, seven being the number of the Spirit. 
Let's have a quick look at these seven blessings without going to the actual references. Revelation 1, 3, we've just seen it. A blessing to those who accurately study and then practically apply the message. Chapter 14, verse 13. A blessing is pronounced upon those who are resurrected to fulfill the prophecy. 16, verse 15. A blessing for those who watch and who are ready for Christ's return. 19, verse 9. A blessing for those who partake in the marriage supper of the Lamb. 20, verse 6. A blessing upon those who inherit eternal life. 22, verse 7. A blessing for those who practically apply the book of Revelation in their lives. And finally, the seventh blessing, 22, verse 14. A blessing for those who keep Christ's commandments. So this is the book of blessing. Then you and I, in a very brief moment of time, today and tomorrow, God willing, can extract something which will lead us to that blessing. We've got to take something away from our studies. We've got our opportunity. Let's take something away. And I think there will be something to take away that can ensure that we're on the path to the blessing that this book can bring. Now, just an overall summary of why chapters 1 to 3 are where they are in the Apocalypse. Gentile ecclesias, of course, by AD 96, when John received the message, had become the focus of God's interest now that Israel had been scattered in AD 70 in the awful events of the overthrow of Judah's commonwealth. True believers are seen to be under increasing pressure from, from apostasy that came from within, largely, and persecution by Rome. Despite dwindling numbers, they hold fast to the things that remain. But false Christianity is gaining ground and more power and influence. It's growing from within the brotherhoods, we're going to see. Christ is warning about that. Christ walks in the midst of the ecclesias during their suffering. He is with them. He knows their works. He knows their trials. Revelation provides encouragement and a vision of the coming kingdom for those trodden down. And it has many, many blessings and promises in it. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. Wonderfully graphic symbol of where we want to be, brothers and sisters. We want to be a pillar in the temple of our God. In the same way, for example, James was a pillar in the Ecclesiastes. Okay? We want to be a pillar in the temple of our God. And of course, it all depends on how we respond to the message of this book. Now, chapter 1 deals with the multitudinous Christ. From verse 12, you read this. Chapter 1, verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, says John. And being turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the midst of, the, of these lampstands, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the, to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. girdle. So it goes on with all the features of the multitudinous Christ. And what we're going to find, brothers and sisters, as we consider these letters, is that most of the introductory and some of the final comments that Christ makes to each of these ecclesias is drawn from this vision of the multitudinous Christ. And we need to recognise that because, you see, he doesn't do that just willy-nilly. He's very careful in the way he selects his introductory comments, usually from this vision, so that the ecclesia who receives the letter will know what he's driving at. They will know that when he talks about a sharp sword coming out of his mouth, that they've got problems in their defence of the truth. They're not using the word of God, the sharp sword, in a way that they should. And we'll come to that when we come to Pergamos. Okay? So you'll see how this works. Now have a look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. It says this. Until the angel of the ecclesia in Ephesus write, These things saith he, that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. So here he is, brothers and sisters, introducing himself as the one who holds the seven stars. Now who are these seven stars? Well, we just need to step back to chapter 1, verses 20, or verse 20, I should say, and pick up the interpretation of the symbology. The secret of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, says Christ, in verse 20, and the seven golden lampstands. 
The seven stars are the angels of the seven ecclesias. Now, I think most of us are aware that by angels here, he means the leadership of the ecclesias. He means what you would call the arranging brethren, or the shepherds of the ecclesia. Those that Paul talks about in Hebrews 13, they're going to have to give an account before Christ for their leadership of the ecclesia in the day of judgment. He's talking about those people in the ecclesia who have the ultimate responsibility for guiding it. That doesn't mean the ecclesia doesn't play a part, but these have the ultimate responsibility to say, this is the way this ecclesia will go. And this is what we will do with the problems in our midst. They're the ones that Christ is writing to. While the letter, of course, is going to be read to the whole ecclesia. It's to the arranging people, to the, to the brethren, to the shepherds, that he's ex actually addressing this message. And he says, he's got these seven stars that is, the arranging brethren of the seven ecclesias, in his right hand. And what does that imply to you? Control. All right? He's got control. He's going he's to hold them accountable in the day of judgment. He is the great determiner of destinies. And therefore, if these brethren, and sadly this is the case with nearly all of the seven, if not all, if these brethren don't make the right decisions, it may well be that they will lose their part in the vision of the multitudinous Christ when it becomes a reality. Now that's, that's what he's talking about here when he starts his letters, writing firstly to Ephesus by pointing out that he's got the stars, he's got the leadership of the ecclesias in his right hand and the day will come when he will judge, he will hold them accountable. He also says at the end of that verse that he walks in the midst of the seven ecclesias. So here are our seven lampstands. They represent the seven ecclesias. Now we're going to see they represent the ecclesias of all ages. Now these letters were sent by John from the Isle of Patmos through a messenger to the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. They weren't the only ecclesiastes in that area, but they're selected by Christ for a reason. And in fact, the order in which we find them in the Apocalypse is the order in which you would naturally deliver them. If you, you came from Patmos, the first city you're going to encounter is Ephesus, you go up the coast of Smyrna and so on, and around to Laodicea. That's the order in which they're spelled out for us in Revelation 2 and 3. Now in Eureka, volume 1, pages 419 to 454, Brother Thomas relates the seven ecclesial stakes to the seven phases leading to the complete apostasy of the Brotherhood in the time of Constantine in AD 312. Doubtless, he's quite right. In the Apocalypse epitomised, Brother H.P. Mansfield uses a wider scope and he suggests that it applies across a wider period of time. Brother Mansfield says that the Ephesian epoch is from AD 96 when the message was received to 110 when the first love was lost at the close of the apostolic era. He suggests the Smyrnian epoch from AD 110 to 312 was noted for persecution of the ecclesia and for the manifestation of the synagogue of Satan that the Pergamon epoch was from AD 312 to 606 when Antipas was slain and Balaamites and Nicolaitans prospered and flourished and of course the papacy emerged in this era 608, 610. The Thyatira epoch, he suggests, is AD 606 to 1572, that's the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day for those who are historians, when true witnessing came to an end and Jezebel was ascendant in the form of the papal system. He suggests that the Sardian epoch from AD 1572 to 1847 is the period of Protestant Reformation. They had a name of repute, but they were spiritually dead. He says the Philadelphian epoch relates to the period of our pioneers from 1847 to about 1947, a period of little strength where the truth was revived in its purity. That's why there's no criticism of Philadelphia in the letter that they received. And the Laodicean epoch, brothers and sisters, is the perilous present from the end of the Second World War through, through, through to our time, 
where prosperity has, of course, been the order of the day. And we're going to find ourselves in all of these, but particularly in this one here, in the Laodicean era, as we consider these letters. Now, that's an introduction. We're going to have a look at one letter before we have a break. This letter to the Ecclesia at Ephesus. We can't possibly hope to do this in the way that we would normally do it in the study class. I would need three classes on emphasis alone. Just got two thirds of the class, okay? So you have to expect, you're gonna get it distilled, but hopefully distilled in a way that will bring home some very powerful messages. Now, Ephesus in 1896 was a large and thriving commercial city known with Smyrna, which was just up the coast, as one of the eyes of Asia. It was blessed with a fine harbour. It attracted, like, of course, Corinth, all kinds of people. It was a cosmopolitan city, and many wares and philosophies, of course, flowed through this city. It was home of one of the seven wonders of the world, the Temple of Diana, or Artemis, which took 200 years to build. And there it is. Of course, it doesn't exist today. I'm going to show you what's left of the Temple of Artemis. But this was the magnificent structure which caused, of course, the Ephesians to come into the, into the amphitheatre and to cry out ceaselessly for two hours. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Paul said, cool, look, this is the best opportunity to preach the gospel that I've had in a long time. And he wanted to go in. And the brethren said, you're not going in there. They will tear you to shreds. And they would not let him go in. Paul wanted to go in. That was the character of our beloved brother Paul. So here is the temple of Artemis. Of course, it relates to what we know as this god, Diana, the multi-breasted god that was said to come down from heaven. You know, that's why they get children to go out and pick up Easter eggs at Easter time. That's where it came from. From this particular god. Okay, now... Smith's Bible Dictionary says this about Diana. The Latin, of course, and the Greek is Artemis, the twin sister of Apollo, the sun god. She is the moon goddess. The Assyrians named them Adramalek and Anamalek. Now, you read of them in 2 Kings chapter 17. Okay, the, the nations that came in and became the Sumerians had them as a god. In Palestine, the name was Ashtoreth. You've read of Ashtoreth in the Bible before? When you read of Ashtoreth and Israel turning to that particular worship, guess what? Worshipping Diana. Later on, the goddess of the Ephesians. The services were performed by women, which would go down pretty well in modern society, and eunuchs, and with a high priest, the great temple in Ephesus and the grove of Daphne were the most noted shrines of this worship. Now, uh, there wasn't too much uh, in the way of uh, self-control in the worship of Diana, by the way. We won't go into the details of that. But Daphne told you something about that. The image of Ephesus was said to have fallen out of heaven complete. The great temple was 425 by 220 feet. It had 127 columns of marble, each 60 foot high. It was a magnificent structure for its day. But that's all that's left of it, brothers and sisters. In a swamp. That's all that's left of it. But, you know, there's something very curious about the picture that you can see on the wall behind me. If you have good eyes, you will see that on this one remaining pillar, there is a stalk nesting up there. A stalk. And Ephesus, within a couple of hundred years, was devoted to Mary Olatry, to the worship of Mary. So Diana had now become Mary, the so-called Mother of God. Isn't that interesting? What happened to the Ecclesia? It became the Roman Catholic Church within a couple of hundred years. That's the tragedy of Ephesus. And it's a fulfilment of Bible prophecy. Now I don't have time to take you back to Zechariah chapter 5. Some of you will be quite familiar with the night visions of Zechariah. And those night visions speak in chapter 5, of two women, Jerusalem and Samaria. It says this, There came out two women, for they had wings like the wings of a stork. They lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven. Look at these, bear the ephah. 
And he said unto me, To build it in the house in the land of China. China! Babylon! China is the Hebrew form of the Akkadian name Semiramis. And Semiramis was the wife of Nimrod. And Nimrod was the son of Cush or Bel or Baal. Okay? And all the idolatries of our world come from Cush and Nimrod. There's only one on earth that doesn't come from it. It's called Christadelphia. Because we eschew and hate the doctrines that came from the brain box of Cush, which were implemented by Nimrod and by his filthy wife, the mother of harlots, Semiramis, known in Hebrew as Shinar. We repudiate that. But the ecclesia at Ephesus ultimately didn't. And the Christadelphians of Ephesus became Roman Catholics and they adopted the catechism of Nimrod and Semiramis. And that's where Diana came from. What a change in a couple of hundred years. What a terrible shame. You reckon that might happen again if Christ didn't come for another hundred years? Brothers and sisters, he is going to come. And it's up to us. It's going to come very, very soon. Up to you and me. Make sure it doesn't happen to our ecclesias. Because it happened in the past. It was in this amphitheater that they gathered. This is the, the symbol of deep and irreconcilable doctrinal division. They gathered. The base of Mount Prion. Looking down over the harbour of Ephesus. It was here, brothers and sisters, that they rushed with one accord, Acts chapter 19, into the theatre. And by the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana the Ephesians. Ephesus, in time, became a poor city. The Caesta River silted up the harbour. It had a magnificent harbour. Slowly strangled trade and commerce. And that was to happen to the Ecclesia as well. The ecclesia became silted up and they lost their vitality. They lost the essence. They had lost their first love and it appears as though they didn't recover. <coughs> That's where they ended up. It became known as the city of change as its fortune sank. By the 4th century AD, the apostasy convened the council to officially install Mariolatry as the official worship of the Ephesians. So what about this greatest Diana? Oh, I'll just give her a different name. That's all. Just give Diana a different name. And so Catholicism became installed, ensconced in Ephesus. But of course that was also ultimately rejected and today you go there, there's only Mohammedans, Muslims. That's all that's left. The harbour sorted up by 1400 AD. Now here is, we're standing up on Mount Prion. You can see that there's a little group down there. They're looking, they're, they're standing in the amphitheatre, 30 or 40,000 seat amphitheatre. And they're looking down the Arcadian Way, which led to the harbour. Now you want to know why it only goes down to here? Well, that's where the harbour was. This is where the wharf was, along here, okay? And when Paul came to Ephesus, he probably got off the boat here, and he walked up the Arcadian Way. Straight in front of him is this massive amphitheatre. Here was the harbour, and the Caesar River is over here. Finally all suited up. That's what it looks like today. And the history of the city, sadly, is also the history of the ecclesia. Now, brothers and sisters, whether or not you're here tomorrow, you'll be at some ecclesia, I guess. And it may be that a letter will be read out. That happens to be a practice in this uh, continent, doesn't it? They read letters, some ecclesias read letters that come to the ecclesia. What about being in this ecclesia on the Sunday morning when this letter arrives directly from the Lord Jesus Christ by John and John's messenger? What do you reckon about that? Sitting there on that Sunday morning getting a direct message about what Christ thinks of your ecclesia. 
That's exactly what happened to the Ecclesia of Ephesus. They got this letter. Now we're not going to have, have much time to, to deal with all the aspects of this. We're going to deal with one in particular. But the summary of this letter would be something like this. In withstanding false doctrine, because this Ecclesia was known for that, they had withstood false doctrine. It says, Thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Okay? In, in withstanding false doctrine, there is a danger of becoming distracted and hardened, sustaining our first love and zeal over the long haul is a constant and pressing challenge. And I think most of us are aware of that fact. So when you summarise the letter that came to the Ephesian Ecclesia, perhaps a summary something like this might be useful. They received Christ's commendation for works, labour, patience and intolerance of evil men. So let's just read a few of these words. Revelation chapter 2 and at verse 2. I know thy works, he says, and thy labour and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them like... I wonder why they did that. I wonder why this ecclesia behaved like that. Well, this is the ecclesia that had an arranging body who stood before the apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20. And he said to them, I've laboured amongst you for a long, long time and shed many tears over this ecclesia, and I know that amongst the brethren standing right here in front of me there are people who will pervert, pervert or twist the truth. I know that. He's looking straight into their eyes. How do you like that? You and you. You'd be rather sort of tentative, wouldn't you? What about the other brethren? They'd say, no way. We're going to be on the, on the watch for that. And for decades later, they were on the watch. And they were very diligent. And Christ writes them in 1896, he says, I know you're intolerant of evil men. Okay? And the trying of the spirits and the rejection of liars. You've done that. Terrific. And he commends them for that. But they had a problem. They had patient endurance and an unwearied effort, he says, about their works. See what he says here. Verse 3, And hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast laboured and hast not fainted. This is a very active ecclesia. They got a lot of works and a lot of patience and endurance. But they've got a problem. Now you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now if that's where the letter stopped, that'd be terrific, wouldn't it? You think? It doesn't stop there. Because they're criticised for losing their first love. Verse 4. Nevertheless I have something against thee, he says, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly. And I will remove thy lamp, stand out of his place, except thou repent. It's a very strong warning. Do you think it's possible for us to lose our first love, brothers and sisters? It's very possible, isn't it? You can defend the truth with all your strength and your might, as the Ephesians did for decades. You can reject those who will not walk according to truth or teach truth. You do all of that. You can labour and still have left your first love. And I know how hard it is to maintain first love. That's my experience. What about yours? Well, Christ has got some advice about that. Now, first love is designed to lead to ultimate love. And the ultimate love that we can have, of course, is the love of God for us and the love of his Son for us. In John chapter 17, verse 26, Christ said in his prayer, And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. So Christ is saying that the ultimate of God manifestation, and that, by the way, is what this vision is all about. This is all about God manifestation. It's the reason for our call, brothers and sisters. That's why we were called to the truth. Not just to be saved, but to be manifestations of our God that he might be glorified. 
And the way you manifest God is to develop his character. And you know you've got his character when it reveals itself in the kind of love that he showed towards us in giving his son. And you do that in giving yourself for others, for the salvation of others. And when you love your brother and you're prepared to sacrifice everything for the salvation of others, you've got the love of God for us and the love of Christ for us. Okay? That's where it leads to, ultimately. But if you lose your first love, you're very unlikely to reach ultimate <coughs> love. That's the warning here. Ephesians 1 verse 4, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Ephesians 1 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and the love unto all the saints. See how love's manifested? And John explained, doesn't he, in his epistles, John says, how can you say that you love God if you don't love your brethren? That's an impossibility. You simply can't love God if you're not giving your life for the salvation of others. That's as simple as it is. So what is first love? If this is what leads to ultimate love, what is first love? Where do we start on this path that leads to the ultimate kind of love, agape, that God wants us to have? Well, there's a clue. There's a clue in verse 5. In verse 5 of Revelation 2, we read this. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. So they've lost their first love. They've fallen. So remember from whence you've fallen. And this is your antidote, he says. And repent which means change your attitude and your way, and do the first works. So first works is a clue as to what first love really is. Now you've heard this matter debated before, haven't you? I mean, I've been in the truth for 44 years. And there's an endless debate about what first love is. How about we just let the Bible speak, okay? I'm going to let the Bible speak about what first love is. But whatever it is, it's also first works. It's about actually doing something. Okay? First works. So that's the clue that we need. And here are a few examples. Now we could multiply these, but just a few examples of what first love really is. Matthew 13, 45 to 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he has found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. That's one element of first love. It's all about forsaking all. And when the truth comes into your life, if you're not prepared to forsake all, including family, then you're not worthy of it. That's what Christ said. You're not worthy of him. So first love is about putting everything else aside to secure the pearl of great price. Nothing else matters. Got it? That's the starting point. Galatians 4.15 For I bear you record that if it had been possible, says Paul to the Galatian brethren, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Now it's evident that Paul had malaria. And one of the symptoms of malaria is a dreadful affliction of the eyes. And your eyes weep and you can't see properly and you look awful. And here's Paul talking to the Galatians. And the Breton down there have just received the truth. And they know they've got the pearl of great price. And they're looking at Paul and saying, Paul, if it was possible we would pluck out our eyes and give them to you. But you can't do that, of course, it doesn't work. But they would have done that. They've just come to the truth. This is first works. Personal sacrifice. And when you first come to the truth, nothing's too much, is it? You can ask a young brother or sister who's come to the truth who grabbed hold of it with both hands to jump over the moon. And they'll say, do you want me to do it twice? Nothing's too hard. Next thing. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13. When you receive the word of God, he says, which he heard of us, he received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, 
which effectually worketh also in you that believe. What's that about? Absolute conviction. There's no ifs, maybes, well, you know, it could be right, could be wrong, who cares? Absolute conviction. That's a first work, isn't it? Acts 19 verse 5. This is in the lead up to Ephesus, isn't it? And what, does, what happens? Well, Acts chapter 19 talks about a group of brethren who only knew the baptism of John the Baptist and been baptised into Christ. And when they heard this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. And they'd been baptised once already. I've known some people who were baptised without knowing the full truth. And when they've come, and I'm not talking here about all the finer elements of the I'm talking about fundamental doctrines. You know, like John Thomas, he was baptised three times. And finally, in 1847, when he came to a full understanding of the hope of Israel, having stumbled over Romans chapter 8, verse 24, which says we are saved by the hope. There's an article in front of the word. He said, oh, what hope? And he found the hope, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant. He found it. And finally he said, I got it. Eureka, I got it. Got someone to baptise him the third time. It's fundamental. And these brethren knew when they heard that they didn't fully understand the fundamentals or the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, they got to be re baptised. Okay? What's that all about? Humility and submission. It's a first work. What about Colossians 1 verse 4? Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. You know, it's something about coming into the truth, isn't it? As you realise the greatness of this heritage. I mean, why me? In my case, I was born into the Christadelphian family. And I'm in my 60s. And I'm just beginning to fully realise the value of the heritage that I was given. When you're a teenager and you're 20, you don't understand the value of it. I mean, you know it's right. I knew it was right. I had no doubt about that. But I didn't fully understand. You ask someone's come in from outside. You ask them. They see it in black and white. And they know what God's done for them. What's that all about? Produces a lot of the brotherhood out of a sense of privilege. Why should I be part of this? And what am I going to do about that? I'll give myself for the brotherhood. That's what you do. It's a first word. Now, look, we could put more up there, brothers and sisters, but that's probably enough for us to jangle around our minds for a while, eh? These are first words. And the Ephesians, though they were defending the truth, had lost their first love. And they needed to go back to tools and start all over again. And if we're in that position, we need to do the same because time is running out. Now, I don't, I don't often quote from Gentile writers. Anybody who knows me knows my disdain for Gentile philosophers. But there are odd occasions when they do say something sensible. And this fellow's name is Swindle. Not S-W-I-N-D-L-E, but D-A-L, double L. Okay? Swindle. So it's not a swindle, I don't think. I think he actually makes a true statement. He talks about the importance of attitude. And this is what Christ is trying to get to with the Ephesians, isn't it? Their attitude. They had a strong attitude against error. Terrific. Tick. They did a lot of things. They worked hard. Tick, tick, tick. But they weren't doing it with the right attitude. An attitude is very, very important. Now, Swindle says this. The longer I live, he says, the more I realise the impact of attitude on life. It is more important than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than successes, 
than whatever anyone might say or do. It is more important than appearances, giftedness or skill. The remarkable thing is that we have the choice to create the attitude we have for that day. Now he's talking about days, we're talking about life. We cannot change our past, we cannot change the way people act, we cannot change the inevitable. The one thing we can change is the only thing we have control over, that is our attitude. I'm convinced that life is 10% what actually happens to us and 90% how we react to it. Now, for once, the Gentile philosopher got pretty close to the mark. Brothers and sisters, I think we can probably take a little bit of counsel from that. So let's just finish off this session. <coughs> Ephesus, it was known as the loyal city in history. And because of its loyalty to Rome, Ephesus was finally granted the privilege of adding to its many titles that of Temple Warden of the Roman Emperor. Wouldn't that be a brilliant plaque to have up on the wall as you entered the city? Temple Warden of the Roman Emperor. What about the Ecclesia? What happened to them? Paul said in Acts 20, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things that draw away disciples after them. A couple hundred years later, they convened a council and introduced Mary Oltry as the worship of the city. How many of our brothers and sisters who once belonged to the Ephesian Ecclesia will be in the kingdom? We know not, but I'll tell you who does know. I know thy works, he said, and I've got your arranging brethren in my hand. And the day of the count will come. He says to the Ephesians, brothers and sisters, that there is a way to renew and to restore is to rebuild.